Good evening. My name is Kathy Latour, and on behalf of this Faculty Student Affairs Committee at the College of St. Scholastica, I'd like to welcome all of you to the fall section of the Warner series for 1985-86. Our speaker tonight is Richard P. Teske, who is an Associate Administrator for External Affairs for the Healthcare Financing Administration, which is part of the Department of Health and Human Services. Mr. Teske is a senior Reagan administration appointee, and he presently serves in HICFA. Prior to that appointment, he served as special assistant to U.S. Senator David Durenberger of Minnesota. He has been the director of governmental and public affairs for the Minnesota Association of Commerce and Industry and the Minnesota State Medical Association. He was the Director of Legislative Research for the Minnesota State Senate and Director of Research, Policy, and Field Operations for the Minnesota Republican Party. Um, Mr. Teske has also been a campaign manager, pollster, and consultant for over 100 local, state, and federal campaigns. In 1978, at the age of 28, he was the youngest Republican-endorsed candidate for state treasurer in Minnesota's history. Mr. Teske has some ties here in Duluth. He is a graduate of the University of Minnesota Duluth, where he graduated summa cum laude in 1971. While he was at UMD, he was elected campus student body president, and he was selected as the outstanding graduate for his academic and student activities. I'd like to welcome Richard Teske, who will be speaking on the role of government in the provision and financing of health services. Thank you, Kathy, for that most kind introduction. As uh, she mentioned, I was a student at UMD, so the snow outside doesn't bother me at all. In fact, I'd be somewhat disappointed not traveling up Highway 35, wondering if I'd keep the car on the road. And it seems like a typical UMD Duluth type day. In fact, if I remember correctly, you were able to wear a, not wear a jacket for the first week of school and for the last week of school, but in between there, you might as well stay inside. And Duluth has not disappointed me. The question of the Warner series this year is health care, whose responsibility? And really, that's a very easy question. And I could sum it up in really five seconds and open it up to the questions, but of course you didn't drag me all the way up here from Washington, D.C. to have me end it in 10 seconds. But ultimately, the answer to that question of health care, whose responsibility is that it's the individual's responsibility, period. And I think most people in America realize that today. They realize that the ultimate person who's responsible for their health and their health care is themselves. Nobody else is going to take care of your body because you're going to absolutely have that responsibility for the rest of your life. And the growth of jogging, and the growth of use of bran flakes for breakfast, and all those other things that we're inundated with ad from advertising through uh, all the other types of journals that we're buying is testament to the fact that the American people realize that it is their responsibility. But really, the essence of the question is not so simplistically put. Health care. Really, the question says health care Whose responsibility to pay? And that's what it's really getting at. Especially if the individual can't pay for that health care themselves. In the United States today, we spend from all sources about $400 billion a year on health care, about 11% of our gross national product. And in answering who pays for health care in America Day, it becomes not an insubstantial question. Out of that $400 billion, the individual pays about 30%, private insurance about 30%, and the government about 40%. Medicare and Medicaid, the two programs that I help to administer at the Healthcare Financing Administration, covers about 30% of the entire health care dollar. The other 10% the government pays would be things such as the Veterans Administration and other public programs. When you look at where the government spends its money, let's just take Medicare for an example, one half of all the expenditures in Medicare are spent for people in the last six months of their life. 
So in light of that fact, let's look at that initial question again. The question really isn't health care, whose responsibility? The question now becomes really sickness care, who pays? Because we're really talking about not people who are in health, but people who are sick. So from that perspective, the public policy's perspective, I'm going to devote the rest of my remarks. What I'd like to do for the remainder of my remarks is, first of all, give you a sense of the dimension of the problem that we're talking about. Secondly, give you the causes of the problems in terms of controlling health care costs. Third, go through some solutions that have been tried and that this administration is trying to control the growth in health care costs. Next, give you a report card on what we see as the results of those reforms. And then finally, dust off a very, very cloudy crystal ball and give you at least one man's opinion of where the health care industry is going to go in the next 10 to 15 to 20 years. First of all, the problem. A couple of statistics that I think is important to keep in mind. The Department of Health and Human Services it has the third largest budget in the world. Only the entire budget of the United States and the entire budget of the Soviet Union is larger. The Department of Defense is about 25% of the federal budget. Health and Human Services is about 40% of the federal budget. The Health Care Financing Administration, the one that I represent, an agency that most people have not even heard of, is the third largest budget in the federal government, exceeded only by the entire budget of the Defense Department and Social Security. When you combine Defense, Social Security, Health Care Financing Administration, and the interest on the federal debt, and you can't touch that when you're talking about budget crunch because that means your country is bankrupt, if you take just those four items, that means it's 70% of the entire federal budget. The other 30% is everything else government does, from paying the Congress to the courts to the justice system, everything else the federal government does is the remaining 30%. And so when we're talking about the federal deficit, if you don't touch those first four things, you'd have to wipe out everything else the government does to wipe out the federal deficit. That's why when you're looking at cost containment, you have to look at those first four items. The fourth item, interest on the debt, is a result of the first three items. So now you're down to the first three items. And if you've been reading your newspapers, you realize that there are many supporters in supporting the Defense Department's budget. And there's a group of people who will, will support the Social Security budget. And oftentimes they trade off one against the other. There aren't that many people protecting the Medicare and Medicaid budget. And we're number three at 10% of the federal expenditures. But there are big bucks there. It used, didn't used to be that way. Next year we'll be spending $100 billion on Medicare and Medicaid. In fact, if the Health Care Financing Administration were a private corporation, it would be number two on the Fortune 500 list. That's how large that agency has grown. But these programs were only passed in 1965, and in the first year, it only spent $3 billion. Now it's $100 billion, only 20 years later. Over the last 20 years, they've grown at 20% a year, which means they've doubled every three and a half years. No other programs in the history of the world have grown so fast, so quickly, to be so large. That's the problem with health care. In most states, Medicaid is now the largest item in your state budget. When I was going to school, in fact, when I was still in UMD, it wasn't Medicaid, it was education. Or in some states, highways. That's where we put our dollars. To educate the young, to build highways, to get the crops to market. And now it's the Medicaid budget. In Medicare, when we came into office in 1981, the Medicare Trust Fund was scheduled to go broke in 1986. Well, now it's scheduled to go broke in 1998. We've bought 12 years in the last four. But the point is, is that by the year 2010, and we'll go into this a little bit later, by the year 2010, even after all the reforms we've presently done in this administration to control health care costs, it will be $1 trillion in the red. That's larger than the entire federal budget today. What's the result of all this spending? Well, in 1965, Health care took 6% of the gross national product. It's now 11%. It's never gone down a single year. 
It's, ev it's risen every single year. And out of that some $400 billion, again, 30% is Medicare and Medicaid, and that is the fastest growing proportion of that health care spending. Well, that sounds pretty dismal. So you have to say to yourself, okay, those are the problems, but what are the causes? Well, we see there are five major causes for the rise in health care costs. First of all, aging population. When the Medicare program was passed in the 1960s, 20 million people were eligible for Medicare. Now there's 30 million people eligible for Medicare. And when the baby boom kicks in, in the year 2010, 60 million people will be eligible for Medicare. Unlike Social Security, which is a pension system, health care is funded a little bit different. A pension system like Social Security is pretty easy to figure out the costs in the future. You have so many people, they retire for so many years, and it's a linear projection. Health care doesn't work that way. For a person 65 versus a person 85, there is a difference in health care costs. We spend 50% more on a person who's 85 than a person who's 65 on Medicare. You couple that with the fact that the fastest growing age group in our population are those over 75, and you couple that with the baby boom, instead of a linear projection in health care costs, you have a geometric curve, a geometric projection in health care costs. So what this administration has done is it's taken that curve and pushed it from 1986 to 1998. But that curve is still there. And that's why we're a trillion dollars in the red by the year 2010. Another way of looking at it, in terms of that geometric curve for our programs, that linear projection for Social Security, vis-a-vis -vis other, every other commitment the government has, is this. Pete Peterson, the former Secretary of Commerce in the Nixon and Ford administration, said that in 1960, 13% of your federal budget was devoted for the elderly. In 1980, 25% was devoted to the elderly. And if we don't change one promise in the entitlement programs, just keep the programs as they are, we don't expand the programs at all, in other words, we don't start covering liver transplants or heart transplants or any other new medical procedure, and we continue the high rate of increases in the Defense Department. Given all of that, by the year 2010, to cover the existing promises in Social Security and Medicare and Medicaid, 67% of your federal budget will have to go to the elderly. Now that poses an extremely interesting philosophical question. That will be, for the first time in this country's history, and almost every other country's history, the first time we will have shifted our resources to the elderly rather than investing in the young. Is that good? Is that bad? Is that right? Is that wrong? That's for you to decide as an American voter. But that is a philosophical shift. And that's something that we should consider in terms of where we're putting our resources in this country. Because health care, because of that geometric curve, will be able to gobble up a lot of those dollars. That's the first problem, the first dilemma, aging population. Second, technology. Technology has brought us wonders. Now we have CAT scans, nuclear magnetic resonators that cost $2 million a throw. We have liver transplants, kidney dialysis. We have artificial hearts. A couple of things. Again, let's just look at it from a cost aspect. Barney Clark. We remember Barney Clark, he was the first patient that had an artificial heart. He lived for four months. He cost, his procedures cost $250,000. The University of Utah picked up $50,000, Medicare picked up $200,000. Essentially, the taxpayers and the University of Utah paid $40,000 a month for Barney Clark to live. Now, this is a harsh question, but these are the types of choices we have to make. Here's a man who abused his body for his entire life, smoked four cigarettes, four packs of cigarettes a day, drank, lived heavily, and then when he turned 63, he said, I need an artificial heart. Should Barney Clark get an artificial heart? Does he deserve one? If you say yes, then you have to say, well, how about that little child that wants a liver transplant? Those cost $50,000 a day. And gee, if we passed liver transplants and heart transplants the same way we passed kidney dialysis in 1972, 
that anybody, regardless of age and regardless of income, can get kidney dialysis from the federal government, and they cost $60,000 per patient per year, by putting in those two new items, liver transplants and heart transplants, you potentially will bankrupt every single level of government in the United States of America. You say, what do you mean? I can't believe that. Well, one, one positive thing you might look at is that the number two health problem in Washington, D.C. is cirrhosis of the liver. And so you'll be saving a lot of government bureaucrats by having a liver transplant bill. But that's what you're talking about in terms of the cost of medical procedures tied with technology, tied to the realities of government spending. On one side, technology is good, but if you say yes to Barney Clark, that's what you're saying. If you say no, Barney Clark does not deserve to have that kind of medical treatment. He abused his body. You are now making the first rationing decision in our health care system that has been made by the federal government. And who's going to tell Barney Clark he doesn't get that heart? The physician? With medical malpractice the way it's going today? The hospital? The federal government? I certainly hope you don't say the federal government. We can make calls about how to finance health care. We don't want to start playing God as government overseers. There's philosophical dilemma number two. Third cause of health care cost spiral, expanded coverage. I touched on one already. In 1972, we covered people with kidney dialysis under Medicare. In 1972, we also covered, regardless of income, regardless of age, anybody who was disabled was open to Medicare coverage. In Medicaid, it's a little different program, as you know. In Medicare, we have one program. In Medicaid, there's 54 separate programs. It's a joint state-federal program. So each state has a different mix of population and a different mix of services it covers. But in those optional services that states can provide if they wish, we saw an explosion of optional services. In fact, in Minnesota, it covers more optional services than any other state in the union. 32, I think it was at last count. California is next at 31. The, sad, the interesting thing about Medicaid is that only six states in the Union consume over 50% of all Medicaid dollars because they have extremely rich programs. And you can point them out. You probably could r rattle them off if even I didn't tell them to you. Michigan, Ohio, New York, California, Illinois, and I forget the last one, <laughs> Pennsylvania. They take 50% of your dollars in Medicaid. Well, you combine aging population with technology, and expanded coverage, you're starting to get the feel of why health care costs keep on spiraling. Number four, good old-fashioned inflation. Now, most of the problem with inflation, of course, was economy-wide. But the problem in health care was that inflation in health care, on average, was running two to three times faster than the consumer inflation. So when we had 6% consumer inflation, we had 18% inflation in health care. And this last year, we've brought health care inflation down to about 9%. That's the lowest figure since the Medicare and Medicaid programs began. But that's still about twice as much as overall consumer inflation. So in other words, we brought overall inflation down, we brought health care inflation down totally, but that ratio remains constant. And if that ratio remains constant, what does that mean? That means gradually we'll keep on taking more and more as a percent of the gross national product. So until we can get that inflation down to about the same as the rest of the economy, health care will keep on taking a bigger and bigger piece of the pie of the gross national product. The fifth reason is our reimbursement system, how we pay for health care in this country. And this is something we can do something about in the government directly, and that's what we've been working on. In the past, we used to reimburse providers of health care on the basis of cost. That meant if a hospital, essentially it meant if the hospital used five tongue depressors, we'd pay them for five. And if they used six, we'd pay them for six. There was no incentive in the system for them to economize. The same thing for a physician. If he did one procedure or two procedures, we'd pay for however many procedures he wanted. Now, of course, on the, on the, uh, on the extremes, there were limits, uh, fraud, waste, abuse, malpractice, and the rest. But essentially, we, we reimburse for what we were charged. The problem was it didn't stop just there. 
the provider had no incentive to be cost conscious. The consumer didn't have any incentive to be cost conscious either, because in the last 20 years, we had an explosion in the insurance industry of what is called first dollar coverage. It meant there was no deductible. And for those of you who don't understand insurance jargon, think of your automobile insurance. You know, if you get in a smack up, you pay for the first hundred dollars and then the insurance company pays for the rest. On health care, it was first dollar coverage. You didn't have any co-payment or deductible. And that was throughout the entire system. So the consumers thought of health care as free. The insurers didn't have to worry about costs because they just passed them on, right? And they could pass them on because the employers didn't have to worry about health care costs. Now, why wouldn't an employer have to worry about health care costs? Very simple. Health care benefits are tax deductible for an employer. And the employee didn't have to worry about health care costs because health care benefits are not taxed as income. So around the collective bargaining table, it was a gimme given to you by Uncle Sam so the employer and the employee could always build up health care benefits because it didn't really cost them anything because Uncle Sam was bucking into that pool. And then all of a sudden the day of reckoning finally did occur because health care benefits became so large the industry itself started becoming non-competitive vis-a-vis international competition. And that's when the industry finally started to say, wait a minute, it's getting a little bit too big. One example, Chrysler Corporation. If you take the costs associated with building that car, the cost of health benefits as a proportion of the cost of that car is twice as much as the cost of the steel in that car. That's why we're having a little bit of trouble competing with the Japanese building cars. And when you're building a product like an automobile, you think maybe the biggest cost might be the steel, but it's health benefits. All right, that's the reimbursement system. Those are the causes. Aging population, technology, expanded coverage, inflation, and the reimbursement system. I wish I could stand here and say we're the first administration that figured this out, but we weren't. Other administrations figured that we had some problems in this area. In fact, when we passed these programs in 1965, by 1970, we were spending as much money on the programs as we thought we were going to pay by 1990. So real quickly in this system, we figured that we were in a little bit of trouble. Now I'll just name off a couple of the things that maybe some of you remember. Wage and price controls, HSAs and health planning, peer standard review organizations, certificate of need, voluntary and mandatory caps on hospital reimbursement. Now all of these things may have had some salient points, they may have been some good, but empirically we know they did very little to control health care costs because when this administration came into office in 1981, health care costs were still going along at 15 to 20 percent increase each year. They didn't make a dent. They all had one thing in common, though. They were regulatory systems, systems from the top down, from the government down to control health care costs, and they didn't work. And they didn't work because they weren't tied into the market. Now, if we were talking about any other economic system, people would understand this jargon. But in health care, we always think it's something different. It isn't that much different when it comes to the economics of the system. We had to get it competitive not use a regulatory approach, deregulate, and look towards competition. And that's what our reforms are primarily about. We are trying to bring competition to the healthcare system. It's a nice phrase, but what does it mean exactly? There are three major philosophical initiatives that we've defined that we mean to bring competition to the healthcare system. The first is consumer information and consumer incentives. Going back to what I was saying about first dollar coverage, we want to increase first dollar coverage. That means more cost sharing by the consumers of health care. Not because we're greedy and nasty and hard-hearted conservatives, but because we think somebody who goes into a health care institution and uses an emergency room as a primary care physician because it's free isn't the best use of resources in the health care system. If they would pay 50 cents or a dollar in the Medicaid program for that visit, maybe they won't use that emergency room. If they have some kind of cost sharing in the Medicare program. Home health, for example, right now, if you have the home health benefit in the Medicare program, 
You don't pay anything for it. There's no first dollar coverage. There's no copayment. We're, in the last five years, from 1981 to 1985, we've seen home health agencies go from about 2,000 to 7,000. What a surprise. The federal government's paying for it, and you get what you pay for. So there's been an explosion there. We proposed, as a trade-off, to increase first dollar coverage and co-payments on one hand to pick up catastrophic insurance on the other. In other words, if you really get into a bad sickness, then the federal government should pick up anything over three to $4,000. We think that's a good public policy trade-off. And it would be pretty much budget neutral. But that was defeated in Congress. In the Medicaid system, we tried co-payments. That, again, was defeated in Congress. Those initiatives basically were beaten down in 81 and 82, and so, and so drastically in 83. This initiative of the three has gone the least far. We're still interested in it, but it's not going very far. The second one, we're a little bit more successful. We wanted to encourage the development of alternative delivery systems of health. Now, why is that important? Let's look at the Medicare program. It was passed as an acute care program for the elderly. That means that it pays primarily for hospital and doctor care. And Medicare is called Part A and Part B, and it was copied from Blue Cross and Blue Shield. What happens, however, is that when you pay for acute care cost for the elderly on a cost-based reimbursement system, you get the most expensive of acute care possible for the patient. And so what happens in the Medicare program is that 92% of all the Medicare dollars are paid either to a hospital or a physician. Only 8% goes everywhere else, to dentists or nursing homes or home health agencies or ambulatory surgical centers or any other type of institution. That means you're paying for the highest buck. So along this line, we developed amongst other things, an HMO option. For the first time, Medicare patients and beneficiaries can now choose an HMO option for Medicare coverage rather than just the standard care coverage. We brought in hospice coverage, uh, I think a much more humane way to uh, help the terminally ill, bring them in home. It's good for the patient, it's been proved that, it's good for the taxpayer because it's more cost effective. In the Medicaid program, it's a little bit different. The Medicaid program is not an insurance program like the Medicare program. It's a welfare program. It's a welfare program for the poor. And it's an entirely different program because it doesn't just cover the elderly and the disabled. It covers poor. 40% of the people on Medicaid are children. They only take 15% of the resources. They come in through the AFDC program, Aid for Dependent Children. Only 15% of the people on Medicaid are elderly, and they take 40% of the resources. Why? Because that's nursing home care. And nursing home care is 40% of the Medicaid program. So if you're trying to solve the problems in Medicaid, you're trying to solve the problems in long-term care, nursing home care. If you're trying to solve the problems in Medicare, you try and solve the problems in how you pay hospitals and physicians, okay? So in the Medicaid program, we were paying for nursing home care, but nothing in between. If somebody didn't really need to go into the nursing home, but they really couldn't handle it at home all by themselves, maybe they just needed to have somebody cook their meals or clean their house, Medicaid wouldn't pay. So in 1981, this administration supported the passage of what we call home and community-based community services, providing those services in between the nursing home and the person who was entirely out of the program. Again, it's cost effective for the taxpayer and serves the needs of the patient or the beneficiary better. We've seen a great rise in ambulatory surgical centers. Again, we're using the incentive of the reimbursement system. The most obvious one today is cataract surgery. Cataract surgery a number of years ago, it used to be a, almost a 30-day procedure. They do the surgery, they put your, your head between two pillows, you'd stay in bed for 30 days and you couldn't wiggle your head. Now it's an inpatient procedure. You go in at noon, you're out at six. 
And you can do it in an ambulatory care setting where you don't risk the infection of a hospital. And it's cost effective, it's cheaper, and it's better for the patient. But in the past, we weren't willing to pay for it under the Medicare program. Those things seem to be working out pretty well. The final one, the final part of the three-part process is obviously changing the reimbursement system. How you pay for services to get it away from a cost-based reimbursement system to something else. Well, that something else, at least right now, for hospitals under Medicare, is what we call prospective payment. In the past, we used to pay after the fact. After they got their bills together, we would pay them, and it was after the fact, so it wasn't prospective. Now we call it prospective because we tell the hospital in advance what we're going to pay for a certain procedure. And we do that by the use of what we call DRGs, or diagnosis-related groups. There are 470 DRGs, and what are they? Simple, in the past, let's say you go into a hospital for a hip replacement. Well, that is a DRG. It's based on a diagnosis. In the past, the hospital would say, well, let's see, we did this test and this test and this test and we used this many resources and they gave them so many aspirins and they stayed in so many days and there's so many physician visits and everything else and they'd write out the cost report and that's what we paid them. Now, we say they're going in for a hip replacement. The hospital knows before they go in there that hip replacement, we will buy a hip replacement for X amount of dollars. It changes the incentives upside down. Rather than the incentive being for the hospital to do more and more and more and have more and more tests, the incentive is we know what we're going to get. That's the absolute dollar amount. So the incentive now is to save, be cost effective. This year, the increase in hospital expenditures was 6% over the previous year. That was the lowest increase in the history of the program. Next year, we expect an increase between 2 and 4 percent. It is working to control costs. There are other things that we've tried. There's a participating physician program where physicians sign up to accept assignment for all claims in Medicare. That means they will accept what we pay and will not bill the patient any more than what we pay except for the usual co-payments and deductibles. 30 percent of the physicians will accept assignment on all claims. The more interesting fact is that two-thirds of our bills that are coming into Medicare are assigned claims, which means the physicians are going for assignment. And we have a physician fee freeze on right now. This administration doesn't like fee freezes. It's only a temporary fix. We got it because we got a deficit problem. A fee freeze just caps what we're paying physicians. But here's the problem with fee freezes. Base, because we haven't reformed what we pay physicians yet. Okay, we've only reformed what we pay hospitals on a prospective payment. Physicians are still under cost-based reimbursement. And here's what the problem is with cost-based reimbursement. And this is why in 1984, when you heard about Walter Mondale's program of just capping costs, it may not work very well. We have frozen the fees of the physicians under the Medicare program, which means the number of procedures, what we pay for each of those procedures, some, some like 6,000 procedures we pay for, have been capped. And that same year, the amount of money we've paid to physicians under Part B has grown by about 15%. You say, well, how did that happen? You've capped their fees. You've frozen their fees. It's very simple. They've done more procedures. Simple economics. They're charging the same for those procedures, but they're doing a lot more procedures. Well, the problem with that is this is a term you have to get used to in the healthcare field. There is no bundling provision there. But that means there's no way to bundle in a group of procedures and put a set price to it. That's what DRGs do for physicians. They bundle a series of procedures. They take 6,000 procedures and they bundle them in a different way based on DRGs or diagnosis. And by bundling those procedures, there's an incentive to be cost effective. We're going to try the same thing for physicians. We aren't there yet. We haven't proposed what we're going to do there yet, but there's three basic ways you can change physician reimbursement. One is for DRGs. You can do the DRG thing again. But the trouble with physicians being paid under DRGs is that when you get out of the hospital and you go to outpatient settings, it doesn't work very well because cost is not a good correlation to diagnosis in outpatient settings. 
It's jargon, but what does it mean? A person comes into a doctor's office and is diagnosed as someone with Alzheimer's disease. Well, they might live for a month, they might live for 20 years. The cost of that diagnosis does not correlate to what we would pay if it's based on DRG. So in an outpatient setting, DRGs don't work very well. Another way to do it is use a fee schedule. Just punch in our computers what all the doctors have charged us in the past, set up a massive fee schedule for those 6,000 procedures and standardize the payments across the country. But the problem there, if you've been listening, is that we don't have a bundling procedure there. And there'd have to be some way to bundle those procedures to control the cost. So we'd have to have some kind of volume control. And we're working with Harvard University and the American Medical Association to investigate that type of procedure. The third way to do it is called capitation. And that's the second word that you have to get involved with if you've never heard it before. And this is also what we'd like to do for hospital payments in the future and for every other provider in the healthcare system. Because we see prospective payment, or DRGs, as an interim measure, not the final solution. Capitation is very simple. Capitation is a payment per head. It works similar to an HMO. And the way we do it would be probably on a geographic basis. We'd come into Minnesota, and we'd extract out of that Medicare population those people who have opted for HMOs. We wouldn't touch that because we want competition amongst alternative delivery systems, right? We'd opt out anybody else who has already chosen another system to deliver health care under the Medicare system. That remaining population, and it'd probably be in Minnesota very small, probably about 50% of the people, because we have a lot of HMOs in Minnesota. In some other states, it might be 80 or 90 percent of the people. With that rest of that population, we'd say, okay, here's how much we'd pay per head for that population. Who will cover them? That sounds drastic. No, it doesn't. That's how corporations cover their employees now. They bring in Aetna or Travelers or Blue Cross and Blue Shield, corporations that are large enough to take that financial risk. And we pay that set amount. What does that do? It gets the government out of the health care business, per se, and it gets it into the financing business. That's what government does well, as I mentioned to some of the people earlier tonight. We do two things well in the government. We know how to collect money through taxes, and we know how to spend money. And that's what this system lets us do. We know how to collect the money through Medicare and Medicaid, and we know how to spend it. But we don't know how to deliver health care services, and it gets us out of that business. What's the results of our reforms? There has been a drastic cut in the growth of health care spending. Hospitals are now starting to think like businesses. They're starting to market their services. They're starting to specialize. That's good. Alternative delivery systems are popping up around the country. Opportunities are abounding for health care professionals. Nurses, yes, are losing their jobs in hospitals, but they're picking up jobs in ambulatory surgical centers and other places. So the demand for nurses in the system as much more than it ever was in hospitals is less. The hospital vis-a-vis -vis the healthcare system is changing. There's been, for the first time in history, however, since the American Hospital Association has been keeping records, a total cut in total employees in hospitals. For the first time in history since they've been keeping records, there's been a total cut in the number of beds in hospitals, and that's good. You know, there was only one thing since 1973 that's gone up faster than the price of a barrel of oil, and that's the cost of a hospital day. And that's, again, primarily due to the way we pay. There are some problems with the system as it presently exists now, however. Patients, it has been alleged by some people that patients are being discharged too early from hospitals, because the incentives now are to get the people out earlier and do less. So now the issue no longer is health care cost containment, because we got that under control, at least in hospitals. It now becomes quality of care. Before I leave cost containment, I want to point out, why did we start with hospitals? OK, what I told you was 92% goes to physicians and hospitals and Medicare. Two thirds of all of Medicare dollars go to hospitals. Medicare covers 18% of the entire health care bill. Put those two facts together, 12% of the entire health care system, no matter who pays for it, no matter who gets it, 
is a Medicare dollar that's paid to a hospital. One dollar out of eight in the entire health care system is a Medicare dollar that goes to a hospital. When you change the way you pay Medicare hospitals, you change a big chunk of the health care system. 25% of Medicare dollars goes to physicians. We're going to change the way we pay physicians. We change that, you get about another 5% of the entire health care industry. And all of a sudden, you start seeing insurers and states and the Medicaid program change the way they pay. In Medicaid, you have to change the way you pay nursing homes. And we're exploring how you do that, but it's a little bit tougher because you don't control your populations in nursing homes. But primarily, that's the role of the states, and the states are exploring some type of pers prospective payment and capitation system for Medicaid programs there. But let's turn to quality of care, because that's the issue you're going to be hearing about now for the next four years. And that's a real slippery slope, quality of care. Everybody thinks they have an idea what it means, but nobody can define it. How do you measure quality of care? In the government and the healthcare industry, there are two major measures of quality of care. And they're very, very gross measures of quality of care. They're not good. One's morbidity. Did they die? And the other is what we call recidivism. If they were checked out of the hospital, how quick did they come back to the hospital? Maybe there was something wrong with their first care. Those are pretty gross measures. Anything outside of that, you start getting into some very subjective judgments. Did the doctor do what was right for that patient? If you don't think so, who's going to make that call? Well, we have a thing called the peer review organizations, the successors to peer service review organizations. And the jury's out on those, if they're cost effective and if they can detect quality of care. We have a number of studies that we're presently doing within the government to try to devise better measures of quality of care. And we're on to some things. But they aren't there yet. But here's the slippery slope, especially for beneficiaries of care, is that any time a provider of care gets cut in his reimbursement, I don't think he'll ever say, gosh, I'm greedy. I got a payment on my boat, and I don't want the government to cut me off. Usually they'll call quality of care. Not in all instances, maybe not in a majority of instances, but certainly it's mixed in with a concern about quality of care. It's disguised as a concern about quality of care. And for beneficiaries, it's easy to worry about the anecdotes that you hear about one person in Janesville or one person up in Grand Forks that may have had bad quality of care. And it's easy to ascribe it to a government reform, but it's hard to prove that. It's hard to prove it from our standpoint, because we're as concerned about that as anybody. But quality of care is going to be the issue. And as we have more and more places to deliver health care, it's going to be more and more difficult. I'll tell you one way you can't measure quality of care. And that's the way we've been trying to do it in our regulations. We have 1,000 pages of regulations for Medicare and Medicaid. And we tried it in 81 and 82 before we were just crucified. I was, in, I was the public affairs director at that time at Healthcare Financing Administration. It seems like the New York Times waited until new, uh, let's see, Christmas Eve day to publish all the nasty things that we're going to do about the regulations uh, in healthcare. And it just raised a ruckus. And the reason for that is it raised a lot of quality of care concerns that shouldn't have really been there. I'll give you how the regulations are written now. In essence, they say, if you're a hospital of so many beds, you have to have a pharmacy of so many square feet. And if you have so many beds, then you have to have so many personnel. And you have to have a dietitian for this shift. And you have to have so many nurses. It's all with inputs. It's like saying, if you have a cake mix and you have all the ingredients, no matter how you throw them in the bucket and mix them up, you're going to have a perfect cake because you got the right ingredients for that cake. That's how our regulations are written. They're input oriented. Nobody looks at the output, except with morbidity or recidivism right now. We have to have output measures. When you pull that cake out of the oven, is it a good cake? When that patient leaves the hospital, do they get good quality of care? It doesn't matter if that pharmacy is 25 square feet and it should have been 30, if the patient gets rotten quality of care or if he gets good quality of care. That isn't the issue. The problem is when you reform these, however,
For example, in nursing homes, what we were going to do is we said we aren't going to be input oriented, we're going to be output oriented. For example, food. We aren't going to say that you have to have a dietitian there 24 hours a day in the nursing home or have access to a dietitian. We're going to put up measures for quality of food for the beneficiary. That's what we want. We want the beneficiary to have nutritious, quality food. We didn't get anywhere. And why? Because the way the regulations are written, it's an employment plan for dietitians. And that's what's also fighting against any reforms in the health care system based on government regulation. We have locked in special interests and were created special interests by the very regulations we've written. All right. What's the future going to be like? Well, as I mentioned, in the reimbursement area, we're going to go towards capitation. States are going to probably follow us in some shape, manner, or form of Medicaid and probably private insurance also. National health insurance? I don't think so. In fact, those countries that have national health insurance wish they hadn't now because they're just eating their budgets alive. We're going to try a different approach, and this country is leading that approach. Part of my responsibilities is to brief the health commissioners or the health ministers of foreign governments. In the last four years, I have personally briefed about 50 different countries' health ministers on our reforms. And it's not just Zimbabwe, it's also Sweden and Norway and Denmark and the so-called socialist models. They're looking. In fact, the most interesting briefing I had, because I couldn't do it directly, we had to just do it by mail, was when the Mitterrand government came into power in France. He had a mixed cabinet. He had four communists in his cabinet, and one of those four communists was the health minister. And because he was a communist, we couldn't talk to him. So we sent papers back and forth. That exchange led him to believe that maybe France should explore prospective payment, and a DRG system for paying for their hospitals. So if you think that's a right-wing reform, well, we got some strange bedfellows. But that's indicative of the problem of health care worldwide. It isn't an ideological battle. Countries on the left and countries on the right all have the same problems. I want to take you out of your health care hat now. I want to talk to you as if I was your stockbroker. Today you've come into my stockbroker office and you said, I've got a little money to invest. Where should I invest? Well, let me tell you about an industry. It's high tech. It has an extremely well-educated workforce. And it's not very unionized. Its market, at least into the year 2010 with the baby boom, its market seems to be guaranteed. It doesn't have almost any foreign competition. In fact, it's the leader in the development of techniques and technologies for its industry. It's also highly liquid, meaning you can get a lot of money out of it. And you'd sit there and you say, high tech, educated workforce, no unionization, guaranteed market. Where do I buy those stocks? Well, guess what industry I'm talking about? Now, if I know that and you know that, guess what? Other people know that. Is it any wonder we're seeing an expansion of things called Humana Corporation, Hospital Corporation of America, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera? And those people are peanuts compared to big businesses like American Express and Sears. No, it isn't the federal government that's making those corporations fail or succeed. It's the very success of healthcare itself in becoming a big business. An industry that's gone from 6 to 11 percent of the gross national product in 20 years and never gone down one year. Now what does that mean in the long run? It means something very interesting. It means first of all that healthcare, the last mom and pop industry in America, is going to change. And why do I say it's the last mom and pop industry? It's very simple. You have your local nursing home with your local board of directors, your local hospital with its local board of directors. You have physicians that are in private practice. There are very few large corporate enterprises, except for suppliers now, 
to hospitals and different places and the people, you know, the medical equipment. There are very few large corporations and conglomerates in the healthcare field. What's going to happen in healthcare? Let's take a hint from the second to the last mom and pop industry in America. That's just gone through the transition. It's called financial services. Or you used to have your local stockbroker, your lo local real estate office. That is now called Sears, where you have one-stop shopping. Or American Express, huge corporations with an umbrella of services. That's where healthcare is heading. Is that good? Is that bad? Well, that's for you to judge, but it's going to happen. Let's give you another parallel of what's going to happen. When my dad went to work in 1930, he went to work for Swift and Company. That was number five on the Fortune 500 list, a big meatpacker. Number six was Armour and Company. I don't think you can find them on Fortune 300 right now. Why? Well, you see, those companies were tied to huge meatpacking plants, tied to huge stockyards. And they did everything. They took a cow and they used every part of a cow. But the small independent meat packers that specialized knocked them out of the business. There was a person who made wieners and there was a person who made hams. And the big meat packers no longer were efficient. A little more recently, we had steel. We had huge steel plants up and down the Mongahela Valley in Pittsburgh. And what happened? Small specialty steel plants and foreign competition based on small specialty steel knocked them out. What's the healthcare industry like today? We have huge complex hospitals. What's the parallel? I'm not talking healthcare, I'm talking economics now. It is reasonable to assume, wouldn't you think, that there may be a parallel. Does that mean that the private practitioner or the specialty nursing home or the independently owned hospital, however you wish to define them, is dead? Absolutely not. In restaurants, you have McDonald's and you still have the gourmet restaurant downtown. It does mean that those who survive have to adapt. And they have to find their niche. They have to learn what their market is. They have to find out that they can't be to all things to all people. If they want to survive with some kind of individuality, they have to create an image and a market and service a certain population. And they can't just turn to Uncle Sam to bail them out because there is no more money in the till. And it can be done. But you know, you take a look at Mayo Clinic right here in Minnesota, in Rochester. If there was ever a specialty organization in healthcare field that has a worldwide reputation, it's the Mayo Clinic. And this year they're opening up two satellite clinics in Jacksonville, Florida, and in Arizona. But, and they'll have Mayo Clinics in those two states. Smart. Where's the elderly population in this country? Florida and Arizona. Where's their satellite clinics? Florida and Arizona. It's very simple. But they're going to keep their quality reputation and their expansion, and they're going to specialize. That's what's going to have to happen in the healthcare industry. Is this good? Is this bad? Again, it's up to you. You're the ones that have to lead that revolution. There's a lot of choices and a lot of philosophical questions I've hit you with tonight. I told you about Barney Clark. I told you my cloudy crystal ball of where the healthcare industry is going. I told you about the problems of government financing, the problems of defining quality of care, some issues that we don't wish to really solve, like the aging population. You know, we don't want to support euthanasia to solve that. That's kind of, kind of a drastic solution. Healthcare is extremely complex. We have one more anomaly that I don't want to touch on, but I think is interesting. You know, in the healthcare industry, we pay providers. We don't think anything about that. It's kind of strange. If we ran Social Security like we run Medicare and Medicaid, we'd pay supermarkets for people's food that they should eat during the month, rather than pay the people themselves. And when people start telling me that healthcare is a right, I say, well, isn't food, clothing, and shelter at least as much a right? And when it comes to food, clothing, and shelter, and it comes to Social Security, we pay those people the money, and we have confidence in them to make the right choices. For some reason, we don't have confidence in people to make those choices in healthcare. There's this mystique. 
That's why we're interested in capitation and competition. It brings the consumer back into that loop of decision making. We're interested in competition and capitation also because it extracts the government from health care decision making as much as possible. But as long as health care is picking up 40% of the bill, you know we're going to be there. But at least when you're delivering health care, we'd like to keep that in the hands of the professionals and the consumer of health care as much as possible. But in the long run, we're going to have to change our expectations about health care. And there's really only two choices. One is we keep our expectations, keep our expectations of what's been promised us, keep our expectations of how health care should be delivered, and eventually somebody's going to come up to us and we're either going to have to ration care or we're going to have to cut back on everything else the government does. Or we're going to have to find out some mechanism that will let health care change and adapt to new expectations and needs. And bottom line, what this administration believes is that in almost every other industry, the marketplace cap competition is the best way for finding that balance. It's not perfect, but it is a better balance than a government planned, operated, and regulated system from the top down. No easy answers, a lot of challenges. But right now, the healthcare system is changing. And those who learn to adapt and change right now will be 10 years from now, the success stories will have their pictures probably on Time magazine. Because when you see problems, that's where there's opportunity. And the person who sees opportunity in the healthcare system today will succeed. So thank you for your attention, and I'll be glad to answer any of your questions.